This week's episode of Myths and Legends is brought to you by Turo. Turo is a peer-to-peer car sharing marketplace where you can book any car you want, wherever you want it, from a community of local hosts. From exotic sports cars to practical daily drivers, you can choose the best car for you, whatever your budget. Download the Turo app, that's T-U-R-O, on the App Store or on Google Play, or visit Turo.com. Get $25 off your first trip when you sign up for Turo and use promo code LEGENDS at checkout. Terms apply. A real quick disclaimer this week, there are some adult themes. Check out the post on mythpodcast.com for more info. This week on Myths and Legends, we continue the story of Tristan and Isolde from the Arthurian Legends. And in this epic love story, you'll see how if you're tipping someone by giving them your spouse, you're doing both marriage and tipping wrong. On the Creature of the Week, you'll learn a helpful use for those dog eye boogers, picking them out and smearing them all over your eyeballs, because that's how you spot werewolves. This is Myths and Legends, episode 135B, Secrets. This is a podcast where I tell stories from mythology and folklore. Some are incredibly popular stories you think you know, but with surprising origins. Others are stories that might be new to you, but are definitely worth a listen. Previously on the show, King Mark of Cornwall, who rules from Tintagel in the time of King Arthur, did not really want to get married but it was his duty to his realm to find or make an heir. So he made an impossibly complex quest for a wife that his nephew, a young man by the name of Tristan, was able to complete. Tristan found Isolde, the daughter of a formerly hostile Irish king, and won her hand for his uncle. Isolde's mother gave the woman's servant, a woman named Brangain, a love potion for Isolde and her new husband, King Mark. Tristan and Isolde accidentally drank the potion, fell in love, and consummated their love on the way back to Tintagel because of course they did. And so Isolde had to find a way around her wedding night, because the king might realize that she's not a virgin. That's when her gaze fell on her servant, Brangain, who got them into this mess. In the flickering candlelight, Isolde kissed King Mark. Their wedding had been beautiful, the day fantastic, and now they were gonna spend all night together. She stepped back, but first, one thing. She took up the candle snuffer and directed her voice toward the door. It was an Irish tradition to never have the lights on. King Mark shrugged. Sure, why not? He was happy to respect his new wife's traditions. Also, why was she yelling? Isolde smirked, and the lights went out in both the hallway and the room. She said she just had to find her way over to the bed, and then things could get started. While she spoke, the door swung noiselessly open, and Tristan, from the hallway, pushed Brangain into the room. The lady-in-waiting trembled, and Isolde thanked her again for doing this. If she didn't, and the king discovered Isolde wasn't a virgin, then Isolde would be in a lot of trouble, and Brangain by extension. The servant girl might have whispered something about how it would be way easier to just get a vial of blood from the butcher and throw it on the sheets but Isolde was already gliding past her and into Tristan's arms. She whispered that she would see Brangain before the first light. As they fled, the pair heard King Mark calling out to his new wife in the darkness, asking if she needed help. Brangain only sobbed in return. In the morning, Brangain lay wide awake next to the sleeping king when Isolde arrived. Her face was tear-stained as, finger pressed to her lips, Isolde warned her to be silent. The new queen wrenched her from the bed and shooed her away from the room before King Mark awoke, lying down in the result of the night. Isolde took King Mark's arm and wrapped it around her. She had done it. She had married the king, consummated that marriage, all while spending the night with the man she really loved. Everything was gonna be okay. But I still didn't hear the sobs drifting down the hallway. Heartache from the young woman, forced to give her queen all her own prospects, just so Isol could lie to her husband. And who knew exactly what rage and disillusionment could drive a person to do? The next several weeks were surprisingly easy. King Mark didn't seem to have the same uh, drive as his nephew. 
And while Isolde had a string of excuses planned, and a servant commanded to wait in the wings for the knights when the king might, uh, fulfill his duty to the people and conceive an heir, Isolde needed neither the excuses nor the servant, because King Mark barely asked anything of her, save her company. He was a wonderful man, but she didn't love him, not like the man she stole away with during the day to spend hours upon hours with in secret. Occasionally, Isolde would review the loose ends. There were two people in the world who knew about the relationship. One was Tristan, who would be in the most trouble should their affair come to light, and the other was Brangain. Isolde thought about it. Brangain was loyal, but she was weak. She had only pulled the wedding night stunt because Isolde commanded her, and she had cried for nearly a week at the loss of her virginity and prospects. When she stopped crying, her old self was gone, replaced by someone else, someone shaky, flighty, and distracted. Isolde knew that if the affair were to be discovered, it would be because of Brangain. If they were to live in any semblance of safety, something would have to be done about the young woman. It wasn't hard to find men willing to kill for money, and Isolde had a lot of money. She spoke to Tristan, and he found men willing to sit down with the queen. It took a little bit more money to get the men to kill a young woman, but they eventually agreed on a price. Brangain was so wrapped up in her own distress that she didn't realize anything was amiss. That is, not until she was walking back to the castle one day. She had gone to the small chapel to pray. In fact, she went there several times a day, except on this day, a large man wearing mail beneath his shirt hurried through the crowd until he was walking right behind her. Then, another man came alongside her. It wasn't until one of them grabbed her arm and pulled her away into an alley that she realized they were there at all. Instinctively, she made to scream, but the other man pressed his dagger into her back, warning against anything too foolish. Outside Tintagel, convinced by several minutes of weeping that they didn't have a runner on their hands, the assassins relaxed. They walked on, the sounds of their footsteps punctuated by sobs, until they found the hole they had dug by the tree. What were the orders? Just like, stab the girl and bury her here? Asked the first assassin. The second threw up his hands. She didn't really give details. She just said, I want the girl dead. That was it. She? Brangain asked, looking up briefly between sobs. Her head sank again. The queen? One assassin looked at the other, and then back to Brangain. She was about to die anyway. Guess it didn't really matter. Yeah, the queen. Actually, since they were talking, they don't really get tasked with murdering too many young women. What had she done to make the queen so angry with her? Brangain looked to the castle in the distance, and she sighed. All she had done, her only misdeed, was giving the queen a clean white tunic when the queen's was soiled. The hands with the daggers behind her lowered a bit. One assassin looked at the other. Wait, is... For real? You just gave the queen some clothes? Brangain cocked an eyebrow and turned around to see the men, their daggers now at their sides. No, it was a metaphor. Both the assassins stared at Brangain for a long time before sharing an understanding glance. Oh, okay. They sheathed their daggers. Sure, they were people who murdered others for money, but even they had standards. They weren't exactly sure what the word metaphor meant. And by exactly, I mean at all but they couldn't imagine wanting someone dead for clean clothes. The first assassin told the second assassin to stay here with the girl. He was going to go to the queen to sort this whole business out. Back at the castle, I sold smile faded, as the assassin informed her that he wasn't back at the castle to tell her that Brangain and her secrets were slowly decomposing in the ground outside the walls, but that she was still alive. She had said something about clean clothes. Was that true? I sold pinched the bridge of her nose and groaned. It wasn't true, exactly. Was that all Brankin had said? The assassin nodded. Isolde nodded. Okay, okay. She could see the assassins were having a real ethical crisis. Which, you know, wasn't that the reason you buy assassins, but whatever. This whole business had already made enough waves for her. Isolde told the assassin to bring Brangain to her. She would deal with this matter personally. And they would be paid in full. When at last Brangain arrived back inside the city and into the castle... The first thing the queen did was hug her. The assassins were as confused as ever, accepting their payment, with a little extra for their discretion, and left. When the door slammed shut, the queen turned to Brangain. 
she was proud of her. It was a test, you see, and she had passed. She had every incentive to tell the queen's secret, but she was prepared to keep it to the grave. Even if the queen was going to put her in that grave, she was a true friend and a loyal servant, and Isolde knew her silence was as guaranteed as Isolde's own. She was sorry to put her old friend through that, but she had to know. Tears began to fall as Brangain hugged her queen. Isolde was all she had. Of course she would never turn against the woman. It was her solemn duty to serve her queen and her friend, even unto death. Isolde stroked Brangain's back as she stared coldly over her shoulder across the room, deep in thought. She knew that now. She knew that. Of course, this whole event isn't really even this complicated in the original. All we know is that Isolde tries to have Brangain killed, the assassins relent after a veiled remark, and then, when Isolde recognizes Brangain's loyalty and sees that she isn't going to snitch on the queen, she feels bad and has Brangain recalled. We ended that piece about it being a test in order to make it a little more palatable to Brangain's character, because honestly, how could you ever come back from that and trust the person again, let alone want to serve them and work for them? If you at least deluded yourself into thinking it was a test, maybe you could try to return to normal after that. Personally, if I was Brangain, I would smile and nod, and then secretly pay for passage on a ship to Ireland and never look back. But Brangain doesn't. She comes back to Icehold, and the scene goes dark as queen and servant embrace. Tristan burst into the room. What was King Mark thinking? What had he done? Where was she? King Mark, hunched over on the throne, pointed toward the window. Tristan ran to it. There, kicking up dust far beyond the castle, just before he entered the dark forest, was a horse. On the back of that horse, tied and gagged, was Isolde. Tristan clenched his fist and was about to scream at the king, but there was no time. He rushed from the throne room. Earlier that day, a knight had come through to entertain the king, queen, and their attendants at a meal with his harp music. The king was so into the music that, when the song concluded, he offered the comely young man anything he wanted in the kingdom, any gift he chose. The knight smiled and looked at the king, and then his gaze turned to the queen. Her. He wanted her. King Mark nearly did a spit take with his wine. Her? That was Isolde. His queen. The knight shrugged. Okay, whatever. He really didn't care what her name was. She was good looking and yeah, he was lonely. The king really didn't put any limitations on his offer for a gift. Pro tip, that would be a good idea next time. So yeah, it would be her. Isolde looked at the king and shook her head. He couldn't do this when he wouldn't meet her eyes, but instead looked to the ground in defeat. Her eyes scanned the crowd for Tristan, but she knew he wasn't there. They tried to avoid each other in public as much as possible. They could hardly control themselves, and the slightest touch or glance might betray them to the barons that were always looking for a reason to push their own brides to the king. The minstrel said that King Mark of Cornwall was an honorable king, was he not? King Mark nodded, but he said, meekly, that the minstrel couldn't have his queen. It was his queen. The minstrel set down his harp and stood. Well, it was a good thing he wasn't just a minstrel then. He was also a knight, and he was prepared to defend his rightful claim to the queen, by violence if he had to. Was King Mark prepared to do the same? Mark looked around, bewildered. His own knights were half a head shorter than the challenger. Already, his barons were barely able to conceal their grins. Mark thought about it. It had been nearly a decade since he fought anyone, and he had told the knight that he could have anything he wanted. The knight was in the right here. Take her, King Mark conceded, neither meeting the knight's nor his wife's eyes. Isolde screams echoed through the throne room as the knight dragged her away, consoling her that she had nothing to worry about. She would be treated well, or not. At the very least, he wouldn't let her go as easily as her husband had. At the last moment, right as the heavy oak doors closed, Isolde screamed something that caught the attention of the barons. She screamed for the one man that would rather die than let her be taken. She screamed for Tristan. 
As soon as she heard the king consent to allow the knight to take Isolde, Brangain had left the room to find the man that Isolde would scream for before it was too late. Mere minutes later, as the sun dipped below the castle behind him, Tristan rode for the forest. The visiting knight and his stolen Isolde rode through the forest, and darkness fell as they slowed their pace. What? What was that? Wait, there it was again. A song from a harp. The knight considered their distance from the castle momentarily. They'd come a long way already. It was probably far enough for one day. He glanced back at Isolde, hogtied and thrown over the back of his horse. She wasn't going anywhere. Yeah, good enough for today decided the knight. They continued on a short distance before coming to a clearing. There, swirling around the crackling fire, was a beautiful tune. As the pair approached, the music stopped, and the stranger by the fire called out. If the horse brought friends, they could have a place around his fire. His name was Tantris. The music continued. Tristan sat before a fire that he had only just finished building before he heard the horse on the path. He tried his best to keep it together, the sight of Isolde bound and gagged. The knight started to explain the woman, but Tristan held up his hand. If the knight was an honorable one, then there was reason enough for that. If not, then it was between him and God. Tristan waved a hand, beckoning the knight to sit by the fire, have some wine and chat. Weary from an eventful day of kidnapping and escaping, and a full wineskin after drinking with this guy for an hour, the knight realized his eyelids had grown heavy. He shook his head to rouse himself, and turned to ask Tristan, the talented harp player in the woods, if he wanted to go on the road with him. They could make a lot of money, or completely legally kidnap queens, it seemed. He rubbed his eyes. What did Tristan say to that? But Tristan wasn't there. He had just finished transferring Isol to his own horse. The knight clambered to his feet, drawing his sword. Tristan drew his own, and admitting that, as much as he loved spending a few hours fighting an armored knight while he was unarmored, he couldn't risk anything happening in Isolde. With a flick of his wrist, Tristan's sword sliced the knight's horse's throat. To the knight's utter surprise, in one swift motion, Tristan leapt on his own horse, and he and Isolde bolted away, before the knight even processed what happened. When they were at a safe distance, Tristan slowed, cut Isolde's ropes, and the pair embraced. Together, they spent the rest of the night in that little clearing beneath the stars. Tristan and Isolde might think they're being sneaky, but the net is closing around them. But that will be right after this. So here's something pretty interesting. Studies show that security systems deter burglars. Wow, I know, right? Like, mind-blowing stuff. But there's also a burglary every eight seconds in the US, which is also kind of mind-blowing. Burglars don't give up just because some of the houses have security systems. They'll find a house that isn't protected. I'm happy to say that our house is protected by Simply Safe and I completely recommend it. At Simply Safe, they believe fear has no place in a place like home. So Simply Safe is smart. It can protect every access point in your home. Doors, windows, garage, you name it. If a burglar even tries to break in, and I mean tries, you can have a glass break alarm hooked up to a siren that will let them know that the police are already on their way. Best of all though, their 24 seven monitoring is just $14.99 a month, and they never lock you into a long-term contract. More than 3 million people already know how good it feels to fear less with Simply Safe, and you should too. So go to the only home security I trust, Simply Safe, by going to simplysafe.com/legends today. That's simplysafe.com/legends for the home security I trust. simplysafe.com/legends. You know what used to be really hard to do? Making a website. I should know. I was the Scrabble Club webmaster in college over a decade ago. Yes, I was very cool. Well, now making a website is one of the easiest things you can do. So why doesn't your new thing have one? Squarespace makes it easier than ever to launch your passion project. Whether you're looking to start a new business, showcase your work, publish content, sell products, you name it, Squarespace is the tool for you. They have beautiful templates from world-class designers and the ability to customize just about anything with a few clicks. Plus, their powerful e-commerce functionality lets you sell anything online and their analytics help you grow your site in real time. There's nothing to patch or upgrade, ever. 
Plus, buying domains is super simple too. You'll have all the help you need with Squarespace's 24-7 award-winning customer support. We're using Squarespace for all our new sites and we love it. It is so ridiculously easy. Head to squarespace.com slash myths for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code myths to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash myths, offer code myths. All right, now back to the show. King Mark didn't see it. Brangain didn't see it, even though she knew it was there. But the barons? Of course they saw it. It was plain as day. Early that morning, Tristan had come riding into Tintagel, his queen sitting proudly behind him. They had gone over their story as they rode back. And though she had hugged him close in the forest, on the road she must be his queen. Cheers rose up from the city as Tristan rode in to see King Mark, who waited in front of the castle, eager to welcome the pair back. But the barons were watching for something. It started the moment they heard Tristan's frustration toward the king and the tone in his voice as he rode off with haste to rescue Isolde. Maybe this knight would simply kill Tristan, the heir apparent, and continue riding off with Isolde, completing their plan without them having to raise a finger. But they weren't so lucky. They rushed to stand by their queen, where they witnessed it. The queen and the king's nephew locked eyes as he helped her down from his horse her hand lingering in his longer than it should have. Only moments, of course. But those moments screamed out to the barons. There was something going on between the king's nephew and the queen. King Mark sat Tristan down in front of him. It was time to talk. If the king failed to have a son, Tristan would one day rule Tintagel and, in truth, all of Cornwall. King Mark sighed. No king ruled alone. This was a good thing. You needed the people and the nobles. It was a good balance. Except in times like this. King Mark stood and went to the window, looking out across his kingdom. There were rumors circulating among the barons about Tristan. Tristan held his breath. He was suddenly aware of his hands and his feet and the look on his face and none of it felt natural. King Mark knew, and the next moments were critical. King Mark continued. He wouldn't repeat the rumors, because that's all they were. Rumors. Jealous old men playing the same games they had always played. King Mark turned back with a smile, and Tristan breathed. Mark remarked that if he believed half the things he had ever heard at court, the barons would be able to play his jealousy like a harp. Still, Tristan would likely be their king one day, and these types of rumors couldn't persist so Mark would starve them of oxygen until the next hottest gossip came along. It was decided. Tristan had to leave Tintagel. He would go and stay in the town beyond the castle walls, and, when it was safe, when Mark found the source and the reason behind the rumors, Tristan would return. The prince nodded. It was all he could do. The king had spoken, and he would obey. On his way out of the castle, he slipped a note to Brangain. The nightly rendezvous between he and Isolde wouldn't have to be rescheduled, but they were going to need a different venue. King Mark's heart pounded as he rushed to his wife's quarters. It was a lie. It had to be. He pulled back the covers, and sure enough, there it was. A twig. His arms fell limp at his sides. So it was true. Earlier that afternoon, he turned a corner to a dark hallway. It was empty, save for a single silhouette standing in the center. It was a dwarf. The king started to demand what the creature was doing in the castle. But the dwarf spoke first. Did the king take moonlit strolls in the royal gardens just outside of town? The dwarf had used divination to learn that a few of the king's own household had been taking some late night strolls. There was a young woman by the name of Brangain, he shared. The king sighed and moved to call the royal guards. But the dwarf continued. Of course, Brangain didn't spend nearly as much time there as her lady. And no one spent as much time there as the man who waited for her each warm night. A young man by the name of Tristan. 
Marching guards clanked down the hallway as Froken, the dwarf, inched closer and closer to the king with narrowed eyes. Before King Mark could argue that it was all a lie, Froken ventured again. When was the last time he visited his wife's quarters and looked beneath the covers? Froken worried that it might be quite dirty. The guards rounded the corner and the king spun around. When he turned back, the hallway was empty. The dwarf had disappeared. The seed he planted, however, remained. Try as he might, King Mark couldn't shake Froken's words. They ate away at him all morning and into the afternoon until he couldn't take it another minute. Off he had gone to his wife's empty bedroom and he discovered the twig. He couldn't believe it. He refused to believe it. And that's why, that night, the king had done some casual stretching before his first bit of physical exertion this decade. Climbing the tree in the royal gardens was way, way more different than when he was a boy. And a handful of scrapes later, he lay panting, straddling a thick branch, waiting to learn what everyone seemed to know but him. His heart sank as Tristan arrived first, finding the softest bit of dirt in the shadows. It had been a lot of trial and error, but they'd finally found the right spot. Always alert, it was then that Tristan saw it. If it hadn't been for a full moon that night, casting a shadow in the clearing, he would have missed the unmistakable form of his uncle, draped over a branch, and desperately trying to hide his winded breathing, amidst empty promises to himself that he was going to start hitting the gym, or at least looking at getting a Nordic track or something. The soft padding of Isolde's feet across the garden pulled Tristan from his thoughts. She grinned, but her smile faded as Tristan shook his head ever so slightly, motioning with his eyes toward the shadow in the clearing. To Tristan's utter shock, Isolde started speaking loudly for all to hear. For God's sake, Tristan, it was wrong for you to send for me like this. If the king were to hear about this, he'd kill us both. King Mark in the tree nodded. Yeah, yeah, that was true and fair. Isolde continued. The king really thought she was terrible enough to love Tristan? She swore, as she had sworn a thousand times, may God strike her down, if anyone had her love except for the man who had her as a maiden. His back to the tree, Tristan allowed himself a smile. Very nice. This would be the last time Isolde came out here. She knew Tristan needed her help. Absolutely innocent of the charges though he was, but she couldn't give it. She apologized to the prince. She loved him because she loved Mark, but if he called on her in the future, Mark would think the rumors were true. Tristan sighed aloud. He was sorry. He knew how this looked, but he didn't know any other way. The king banished him from the city, but it was only because the barons were trying to keep the king away from his blood relatives. They were trying to poison the king against his nephew and his wife, because dividing his house made them stronger. But where were the nobles when it came to killing Morholt way back when? And where were they when it came to finding Isolde? They were doing what they always did, sitting in safety and trading in rumor to advance their own positions. Tristan needed an advocate in court, and there was no one better than the queen. She was the only one he could trust. Isolde groaned quietly. Really? That's what he was going with? All right, she could work with that. After all, the show must go on. Isolde stepped closer to Tristan. Wow, you looked really handsome in the moonlight. <clears throat> she cleared her throat. I can't help you, she said boldly. Tristan had to think about how this looked for her. She told him to run. He was a knight of royal lineage. He could go find service with any other king. Tristan looked at the ground. All right, now it's time to sell it. He looked again to Isolde. Was he to leave his king and uncle to this nest of vipers? He would rather die. Isolde cringed a little bit. An actor Tristan was not, but she could see that Tristan's proposal had landed where it mattered. Up in the tree, there were tears. The pair parted, and, really helping it to sink in, Tristan prayed to God, loudly, begging for protection for his dear uncle. Elsewhere, the dwarf, Froken, was out at night looking at the stars. Things had gone well with the king that day, but he had this feeling... Uh-oh. The dwarf sighed and started packing. He wouldn't have time to get aboard a ship before dawn. According to the stars, the streets would be packed with soldiers looking for him by then. Whales it was then. Bummer. Froken, with all of his possessions on his back, 
slipped from the town of his birth, likely never to return. His only sin? Wanting to inform the king of his unfaithful wife and the threat to his dynasty literally out of the goodness of his own heart. One year later, one of Mark's top barons was walking through the garden when he heard it. Or rather, heard them. Again, he put it out of his mind, or tried to, but the couple only grew louder. Over the past year, he and the other barons had seen them in the gardens, in the forest, in the kitchens, in the libraries, and even in the king's own bed. It didn't matter though, as long as King Mark didn't see it, and as long as the pair didn't leave any physical evidence, there was nothing that could be done. The first time they had found Tristan and Isolde together, in the king's own bed no less, they told the king immediately upon his return from the latest hunting trip. He casually replied that he knew Tristan and Isolde were trustworthy, and if they even insinuated otherwise again, he'd set them on fire and make their families watch. Learning this, the couple became even more bold. They didn't want to rub the barons' noses in it. They simply didn't care who saw them. They were untouchable, and if they had their way, they'd spend all day in each other's embrace. It got to the point, and I'm not joking about this, that Tristan was given a bed in the king's own room. So, on nights when the king was out, Tristan would simply walk a few steps between the beds and spend the night with the queen. I think no man in history has ever been so thoroughly cuckolded as King Mark, but willfully or otherwise, he was oblivious. The barons, however, were not. And the longer the queen went without an heir, the more likelihood that Tristan, the one they had conspired to exile, would become king. Their king. They were at a loss. And that's when he showed up. Froken, the dwarf, had been reading the star since the night he fled into darkness. At first he was informing Mark out of his loyalty to the king and the realm. But now, having been driven out from his own home, he sought revenge. It was safe to return now, he knew and Tristan and Isolde's reckoning had finally come. Froken would be the agent of their destruction. That's why, on a night when the king came storming back, he found the dwarf once again blocking his way. He shouted for the guards, but heard a cry from his own room. He had been called away on a pretense, that there was a message from King Arthur and Camelot. He'd risen from bed, leaving Isolde sleeping next to him, and Tristan snoring nearby to find out what was going on. There was no message, of course, only a reason to get King Mark out of the room. Tristan heard the creak of the door, a sound he had become quite accustomed to since Mark rose early, and it gave the prince an ice hold an hour or more each morning. When the king left, he put his foot to the floor, but stopped before it was touched. A flower from the kitchen blotted the stones, glowing in the moonlight. He smiled. Someone was trying to trap them. He looked at Isold, who was just waking up in an empty bed. She sat up, glancing at the door, closed in front of a dark hallway, and she patted the space next to her. What was he waiting for? Tristan smiled, stood, jumped, and tore. He nearly cried out, wincing from the pain. Just the previous week, he had gone on a hunting trip with his uncle. Tristan was out of excuses, and he knew it, and there would be no avoiding King Mark's invitation any longer. So the prince had gone out, but since most of his spare time as of late had been spent in bed, he was well out of shape. A large boar had caught his side, and he was rushed back to Tintagel for medical attention, where he was promptly put back into bed. He should never have gone out, for multiple reasons, he decided. By now, it had been a week since he and Isolde had been together, and Tristan was feeling well enough to jump. Or so he thought. When he landed clumsily next to Isolde, he tore open his stitches anew, and that was when the pair heard shouting from the hallway. Not knowing about the dwarf, thinking it was a trap, Tristan held his open side and painfully jumped again, slamming into his own bed, which scraped to a stop on the floor. The shouting fell silent from outside. From the other side of the door, they heard Froken yell, if you cannot take them together, go and hang me. Instantly, the door exploded inward as King Mark's lantern illuminated the scene. Both Tristan and Isolde sat up in bed. There weren't footprints on the floor, as the dwarf had thought when he covered the floor earlier that night, but there was something better. Blood. Blood from Tristan's wound was in King Mark and Queen Isolde's bed, and it trailed over, clumping on the flower below, until it flowed through Tristan's hands and soaked his mattress. 
King Mark stood on the brim of tears. So the rumors were true. Isolde, his queen, was having an affair with Tristan, his nephew. The two people he loved and trusted most in the world had betrayed him. He had caught them in the act. The soldiers, barons, and a handful of servants came running. Tears welled in King Mark's eyes, but he clenched his jaw. Now was the time to be king. It was obvious what was going on. There would be no use trying to defend themselves. For this crime, they would die in the morning. Next week, we'll finish the story of Tristan and Isolde. Watch Tristan turn into a flying squirrel. Not really, though. And we'll see what happens when the Knights of the Round Table come recruiting for a generation-defining quest. I want to say thanks to Ten Eye Ban, Mickey's Wonderland, Yuji, Ali the Badger, R. Thomas 523, Disappointed Honda Owner, Ali Hugs, RJ Garrett, Review I Had to Do, Painted Pixie, BME Girl, and Mojo Jojo's Dojo. That was a hard one to say. For the reviews on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for writing a review and for taking the time. If you'd like to leave a review, Apple Podcasts is still the best place. And you can find the show there at apple.mythpodcast.com. There is also a membership thing on the site. For less than the price of 100 baby chicks. Yeah, apparently chickens are really cheap online. Anyway, for less than the price of 100 chickens, you can get extra episodes, source pack ebooks, and ad-free versions of the show. That are way less work to clean up. But probably will not give you delicious eggs. Actually, for this cheaper price, these are male chickens, so... They're not going to give you eggs anyway. Just go with a membership. Check out support.mythpodcast.com for more info. The creature this week is the Lou Guru. And no, not the Roo Guru, as we did a while back. That one was a werewolf in Louisiana. Or is this one is a Caribbean werewolf? Both are French names, so I'm going to continue butchering that language this week. According to one source, Lou Guru means a man who turns into a wolf. I plugged it into Google Translate and came back with Wolf Werewolf, which is kind of, but not at all the same thing. Like most werewolves, the Wolf Werewolf is a big human-wolf hybrid that walks on its hind legs. Except when it's being ridden by the devil. One way to tell if you're actually a werewolf, you know, aside from waking up after a night of terrorizing your loved ones as a wolf, is to check your palms and knees for bruises after those long devil rides. Werewolf hunting is never a good idea, but it's even worse for the potential hunters of the wolf werewolf, because it's not those who have been bitten by the wolf, but those who shed its blood while it's in wolf form that turn into the wolf. If you manage that, congratulations, because you're now a violent wolf monster in the devil's uber. On the plus side, if you can go 100 days without telling anyone about it, you're free. I'd just try to get some of those purple stretchy Hulk pants so that no matter where you wake up, you're clothed. If your friend or loved one just bought some purple stretchy Hulk pants in bulk and is coming home every morning covered in fresh animal blood and you're wondering, hey, I think they might be a wolf werewolf, then there is a way to find out without confronting them. Do you have a dog? Because you're going to need a dog for this one. You know those eye boogers that your dog sometimes gets? Well, you're going to want to stockpile those and then rub them all over your eyes. Then, all you need to do is look through a keyhole and your dog mucus coated eyes will help you see who is secretly a wolf werewolf and who's just completely weirded out by a person carrying around a keyhole and looking at them with a budding eye infection. That's it for this week. Myths and Legends is by Jason and Carissa Weiser. Our theme song is by the band Broke for Free, and the Creature of the Week music is by Steve Colmes. There are links to even more music in the show notes, and I want to say thanks again to Simply Safe for sponsoring us this week. Studies show that security systems deter burglars, which is why securing your home is truly a necessity. So let me recommend this brilliant security system built by my friends at Simply Safe. At Simply Safe, they believe fear has no place in a place like home. So they made Simply Safe ridiculously smart with 24/7 monitoring for just $14.99 a month. So go to the only home security I trust, Simply Safe, by going to simplysafe.com/legends today. That's simplysafe.com/legends for the home security I trust. simplysafe.com/legends. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll see you next time.